Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 16. And the title of the sermon is Encouraging and Praying for One Another. We have finished our study of this section that began in verse 3 through verse 14 of chapter 1. It was one long sentence in the Greek structure, and it was all praise for God and what God has done for the believer. In these verses, Paul explained the truth that's ours in Christ Jesus. And Paul blesses God for what he has done for us. We saw that in verse 3, where it says, Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, as we read verses 15 onwards, we come to the prayer of Paul. And this is the pattern that Paul uses through the book of Ephesians. He presents to us truths, and then he prays that his congregation would be able to understand those truths. He does that in chapter 1, verses 15 through 23, and he will do that after he speaks in chapter 2. He goes through the prayer in chapter 3, where he's praying that his congregation would be able to understand what he has taught them so far. In verses 15 to 23, Paul begins with thanksgiving and prayer. He prays to God and he states that what he desires that God would do in the lives of his dear people. His prayer is that we would be able to understand all that he has laid out for us. As we read the prayer in verses 17 through 23, we see the following. We see that they would be having a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. That the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened. That they would know what is the hope of His calling. What are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints. And what is the immeasurable greatness of His power towards us who believe. Those, the, these, we will look at these verses in the following weeks to come. Today, we will look at verses 15 through 16. In verse 16, Paul is giving thanks and praying without ceasing. We'll look at the contents of what he's praying, as I said in the next week. Today, our primary focus is going to be on the Thanksgiving part. And we'll take a little bit of peek into what prayer is like today. Let me read verses 15 and 16. It says, For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. We can make two observations here. Are we encouraging other believers in our church? Verse 16a, the first part of 16a. The second, are we praying for other believers in our church? The second half of 16, verse 16, and that's 16b. Let's look at the first point, the first observation. Are we encouraging other believers in our church? How is Paul encouraging other believers in the Ephesian church? Paul is thankful for them. And he gives thanks to God. He is thankful to the Lord that these people are walking in the faith. That they are Christians. Second, he is thankful that the evidence of their faith is seen in the way they love each other. So let's look at verse 15, because 15 precedes 16 there and says, For this reason, because I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you. Two truths that we see in verse 15, that is a mark, or should be the mark, of true believers all over. First is their faith in the Lord Jesus. And the second is that they had love towards all the saints. This is the roadmap I wanted to lay out for you so you're able to see clearly where I'm going with this. 
we got our truth, the main observation from verse 16. Paul is giving thanks and Paul is praying. And now we're going to look at what is he giving thanks for. And we see what he's giving thanks for in verse 15. And there are two things that he's giving thanks for. He's giving thanks for the fact that they were walking in the faith and that they were praying for one another. Is that clear? Is the road map clear? All right. Let's look at the faith that they had in the Lord Jesus. The Apostle Paul says, I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus. Meaning, he has understood or perceived the sense of what is being said. He had not, just, he had not seen the Ephesians face to face for about 8 to 10 years before he wrote this letter. But now he has heard that they were continuing in their faith. They were still believing. They were exercising their faith. It was not some fad or some passing emotion that they had come to and now it disappeared all of a sudden and now they are just walking normal people. No. Paul is saying here that these people had come to the faith and they were continuing in their faith and their belief as Christians. What does it mean? To be continuing in, on in their faith. Paul could see evidences of that in their lives. That gave the Apostle Paul definite assurance that they are walking in the faith as believers. These are evidences that we can look for in our lives and we can look for in the lives of people around us. How do we know that we are Christians? How can others know that they are Christians? I mean, any man can say that they are Christian. I mean, anyone can say that about us, we are Christians. There must be some tests or evidences in our lives that will reveal the true nature of our faith. But before we begin to talk about the evidences of faith, let me lay down some foundational truths. There is the position that we have in Christ... And the practice that we have because of who we are in Christ. Our position in Christ is not based on our practice. We are not saved because we live a certain way. We live a certain way because of who we are positionally in Christ. We live a certain way because we are saved. Is that clear? This is what Paul had explained in verses 3 through 14. Paul wanted us to know that we are in our relationship with the eternal God because God chose us, because God predestinated us, because God adopted us, because God redeemed us, because God forgave us, because God gave us all the inheritance we needed, because God sealed us with the Holy Spirit. Paul wanted us to know that all our inheritance that we have, all the blessings that we have, are given to us by God, and it is in Christ, and that is we are in Christ, and that is positionally we all are in Christ. Because if we don't know who we are positionally in Christ, if we are ignorant of our identity in Christ, it's impossible for us to act a certain way. Unless and until we do not get a grip on our position in Christ, we will hopelessly try to live a life that matches our position. We must also remember something about our position in Christ. Positionally, we are holy in Christ. We are adapted into His kingdom. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God. We are perfect in Christ. Meaning, if you and I were to die today as believers, our soul will go directly into the presence of a holy God because our soul is pure, perfect, ready for heaven. Because we are in Christ. This is what we read in Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1. You are holy. That means if you're a believer, positionally, God looks at you. You are holy. We also read in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 7. That we are to cleanse ourselves. 
So positionally, we are holy in Christ, but in our practice, we are to cleanse ourselves of all our filthiness and of our uncleanness. We have perfect righteousness of Christ, so we are perfectly holy, but in reality, our practice is completely a different story. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 reads, So that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. So as children of God, believers, we are partakers of the divine nature. But having said that, Peter goes on to say in verses 5 through 7, he says, For this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Peter is encouraging his readers to match up their practice with their position. He says, this is who you are, and because you say this is who you are, this is how you need to behave. Is that clear? You act because of who you are. Our practice has nothing to do with our position before God. We are to live holy lives because of who we have been made in Christ. We do not gain a right standing before God by practicing righteousness, but rather our practice of righteousness demonstrates that we are truly born again. Is that clear? I'm going to repeat that again. It's important for us to hear that. We do not gain a right standing before God by practicing righteousness, but rather a practice of righteousness demonstrates that we are truly born again. It's like when we are born. We are born complete. We just need to grow. It's like Jimmy born into this world. Jimmy has all the body parts. But then Jimmy eats and eats and eats. And as Jimmy is fed, he begins to grow. The parents don't feed Jimmy, hoping that Jimmy will have, to be, have eyes pop out of the back of his head. Parents don't feed Jimmy more spinach, hoping that Jimmy would now begin to develop wings. Jimmy is fully formed as a man. And all that he needs to do is grow and grow and grow. This is the same with our spiritual life. When you become a Christian, you are complete in Christ. And all that you need to do on a daily basis is grow to Christian maturity or spiritual maturity. Positionally, you're complete in Christ, but in practice, we need to grow and we need to live in the light of who we are. That's it. I had to lay down these foundational truths on justification. Because what we are going to say now, if not properly understood, would be perceived as legalism. So we need to lay this foundation down. And now let's come back to the scriptures. Now before we get into Ephesians, I want you to read Second Corinthians. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize as about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. Paul is saying, you got to test yourself to see whether you're in the faith. What is Paul talking about? And so now turn back with me to Ephesians 1, chapter 1, and it says in verse 15, for this reason, because I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus. What faith is Paul talking about? Is Paul saying that they are believing in God? And I've heard of your faith. And that's not an acid test for Christianity. I mean, because if you survey people in our city, many will tell you that they believe in God. 
You go to a Hindu and they'll say, well, I believe in either Brahma, Vishnu, or Shiva, one of the three gods. You go to a Muslim, he will tell you, I believe in my prophet Muhammad or Allah. If you go to a Buddhist, a Buddhist will tell you they believe in Buddha. Is Paul saying that they believe in God and so I'm thankful? No, the, the, prof, uh, the Apostle Paul is specific here. The Apostle Paul is saying that he's talking about their faith in the Lord Jesus. Well, then there are many people who will say that they believe in Jesus. They will say things like this. I was born in a Christian home. My mom believed in Jesus. She was always in church. She was head of the women's ministry. My dad was always in church. He did men's ministry. As far as I remember, I grew up in church. I may not have been in church for a few years, but I'm back in church now. Is this what Paul is alluding to by saying that they had faith in the Lord Jesus? I see many of you nodding your heads. You know that. Or is the faith that Paul is referring to a mere head knowledge of the stories of the Bible? Like someone says, I've been in Sunday school all my life, and so I'm a Christian. Or as someone would say, I'm a good man. I don't do any harm to anyone. I'm religious, and so I am in the faith as if our conduct and behavior makes us a Christian. Let me tell you something. A, pers a person's character, his race, his culture, his morality, his membership in the church, his activities in the church, or his knowledge of the Bible does not say anything about a man's faith. So what is faith? What is true saving faith? In order to understand the faith that Paul is talking about, I want you to turn to a couple of scriptures with me. Would you please turn with me to James chapter 2. Hebrews and James. James chapter 2 verses 14 through 20. Here, James is saying, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith, but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I'll show you by my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well, even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? What is James trying to tell us here? James is stating here specifically that mere intellectual affirmation of a set of creeds is insufficient to show true faith. Because the outworking of true faith, true saving faith, results in obedience. James is saying that mere words of compassion without acts of compassion is useless. In the same way, a kind of faith without works is empty profession. It is not genuine saving faith. Because true faith demonstrates itself in good works. If you turn to Hebrews, the letter right before James. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. It reads, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Holiness is characteristic of true saving faith. You will desire holiness in your life. First John 
chapter 2, verse 29, we see that there will be a habitual lifestyle of righteousness. If someone professes to be a Christian, yet his life is marked by unrelenting disobedience to God's word, there's no repentance or divine discipline. It is certain that his or her profession of faith is not genuine. First John chapter 3, verse 9 reads, No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him. And he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. A man of God who walks in the faith will not keep on sinning. It will, he will not have a habitual pattern of sin in his life. Now you'll say, well, does it mean that we will never sin? No. When you read First John, it clearly says, if you say you're ever without sin, you are a liar, not of God. But at the same time, if you're habitually living in sin, it is a sure indication that you're not a child of God. True faith also includes repentance from sin. Otherwise, how can there be obedience to God without repentance? Turning from sin to God for salvation. Would you please turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Verse 9. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. Reads, For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Do you see those phrases? I want you to look at these phrases. How you turned to God Turn from what? From idols. You turn from evil. And what did you turn from e evil to do? To serve the living and true God. That's repentance. True saving faith is characterized by genuine forgiveness. Matthew chapter 6 verses 12 through 15 we read, If you do not forgive men their trespasses... Neither will your father forgive your trespasses. Characteristics of true faith. You will not harbor bitterness in your heart towards a fellow believer. Because of experiencing, because you've experienced the genuine forgiveness of Christ and the mercy of Christ, you're so willing to pass on that genuine mercy and forgiveness to another believer. Another observation of true saving faith, would you please turn with me back to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. It says, For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus. It is not just faith in Jesus. It is not just faith in Jesus Christ. Paul uses the word, in the Lord Jesus. This is the Lordship of Christ. It means Jesus is sovereign. It means He is completely sovereign in your life. He has total dominion over you. He is the captain of your life. He has the ultimate mastery over your life. He has complete authority over your life. You are completely submitted to Jesus Christ and you say, whatever you want me to do, I will go. Wherever you want me to go, I will go. Whatever you want me to do, I will do. You are submitting yourselves to the Lordship of Christ. Jesus Christ becomes your King. Now many of us don't understand who a King is because we live in a democratic country. But if you understand monarchy... And you understand who a king is. A king has total control over the subjects. And that's who we should be. Jesus Christ is our king. And he has complete control over every area of our life. The way we think, the way we act, the way we dress, the way we talk, the way we relate. 
everything. And this is the true meaning of Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. People quote this all the time without paying attention to the semantics there. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is what? Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Yes, it is that simple. But do you know when you say Jesus is Lord what you're implying? You're implying that everything from now on as a believer is under his lordship. That means you have turned from your sin, as we read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. You turn from evil. You repented of your sin, and you're turning to God. You cannot believe in Jesus as Lord if you haven't repented of your sin, can you? And by the way, repentance is a lifestyle. You're daily repenting of your sins. There is no salvation unless and until one comes to Christ acknowledging him as Lord. I'm not saying it. I'm just reading out of Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Unless and until you affirm him as Lord, you acknowledge him as Lord, you obey him as Lord, you surrender your life to him as Lord, you affirm with every being that he is the Lord of your life. This is true faith. This is true saving faith. And my question to you this morning is, are you walking in the faith? Or is it just a form of Christianity that you're living in that is not biblical? A form of Christianity that's called cultural Christianity. Well, I started going to church nine months before I was born, so I'm a Christian. What makes you a Christian? Having said that, I want you to go into your outline because I want you to connect what I'm trying to say now. Is It says, are you encouraging other believers? Now, in order for you to encourage other believers, and encouraging is the whole thing, we'll come into that, is the question arises, in order to encourage other believers, you need to be pouring yourself into the lives of other believers, right? How would you encourage other believers if you're not knowing who they are and knowing what they do and knowing how they live? Can you? Encouraging doesn't mean you walk into the church and say, Hi, bye, good to see you. Great weather outside, it's getting cooler. Are you pouring yourself into the lives of other believers? Because as you pour yourself in the lives of other believers, you will start seeing evidences of faith in their lives. They will start seeing evidences of faith in your life. Galatians chapter 5, 22, we read, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Are you seeing the fruit of the Spirit in your life? Are you seeing the fruit of the Spirit in the lives of others? And as you come alongside to encourage one another, you will see if they are walking in the faith or not. Now you'll say, Pastor, I don't want to meddle in other people's business. Well, the Scripture exhorts you to encourage other people in regard to their spiritual lives. You may say, where in the Bible does it say that? Yeah, let me tell you to turn to. Please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Verses 24 and 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Yes. Does this mean just pat on one another's back and say, good job, keep it up? Is that what it's saying? Well, it's stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day, capital D, capital D, day, day drawing near. For if you go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. So here is encouraging each other in the light of spiritual life, your spiritual growth. It's not just saying, good job, well done. 
You're involved in the lives of other believers to strengthen them in their faith, to build them up in their faith. And how do you do that? The Bible tells you that in Hebrews chapter 10. You're stirring them up. You're stimulating them. Like if you see someone on long-term medical care, the nurse comes along and stimulates them, makes them get up, moves their hands, their fingers, so that their muscles are not atrophied. You're inciting them. That's what Hebrews 10 is telling you to do. Pour yourselves, stir up another believer. Come alongside them. Hold them accountable to the confession of faith. You want another reference? Second Timothy. Would you please turn with me to Second Timothy chapter 2. Verses 1 and 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. Verses 1 and 2. You then, my child. Paul is so compassionate. Calls Timothy his child. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, what do you do? Entrusted to faithful men. Now, this is what I want you to catch. Who will be able to teach others also. That's what the church is to be doing. As the word is being poured out into your lives, you go about stirring one another. Imparting yourselves to other people. Duplicating yourselves. Are you discipling someone in this church? If not, find someone. Find someone of the same gender. Keep in mind that you are mature in the faith. Why? Because someone else has poured their lives into your life. So it's a great opportunity for you to pour your life into another believer. And if you don't want to, you don't want anyone pouring their lives into your lives, maybe there's something going on in your lives. Maybe it's pride. Maybe, I don't know, it's self-righteousness. Romans chapter 15, verse 14, Paul says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and listen to this, Romans chapter 15, 14, able to instruct one another. The Bible encourages us to instruct one another. It's not an alien concept. It's not barging into one another's privacy. We are not lone ranger Christians here. We all need each other. And we'll only grow spiritually when you pour into one another's lives. And when you do that, folks, listen to me. When you do this, you will be able to know if someone's walking in the faith. You will be able to know if this man loves his wife dearly. You will be able to know if this wife really pours into her husband. You'll be able to know if this guy who calls himself an elder is really a man after God's own heart. You will be able to know if your pastor who is standing up here and, and, and proclaiming the word is really the man that he seems to be. Pour yourself into my life. And as you begin to do this, you will hear the faith of another believer. And as you hear about the faith of another believer, you will be able to thank God. And like Paul, say, I thank my God without ceasing, unstopping, unstoppingly. Is that a word? Without ceasing. Folks, when I sit and disciple other men, it's such a joy to hear their testimony and what they're learning. And there are days that after I leave, they leave the room, I am just, I'm just in tears praising God. It's a privilege. You don't need permission to disciple someone else in this church. Find someone. And disciple, pour yourself into another believer. 
Let's come to the second two truth that you find there in your outline. The second cardinal truth, the mark of a true believer is that are you loving another believer? And we find that from verse 15. Would you, well, I want you to get back to Ephesians 1 because I don't want you to lose track there. Come with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints. This is the argument of 1 John chapter 4. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, the Bible says he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. In the congregation, in the book of Ephesians, you had the Jew and the Gentile. Two groups of people. Two different cultures. Two different religious affiliations. But now united together under the truth of God's word to become one body in Christ Jesus. Their former difference made no difference to them. They loved one another as brothers and sisters, and this brought joy to Paul's heart. Love between believers is a sign of genuine saving faith. Worldly love reminds us to love ourselves first and place our priorities first before others. It says things like this. You need to love yourself first, and only then you'll be able to love someone else. Well, that's the opposite of what the Bible says. Would you please turn with me to Mark chapter 12? Mark chapter 12, verses 30 through 31. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. That's the vertical relationship. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's your horizontal relationship. But I want you to notice this. You shall love your neighbor as yourselves. Jesus saying, you are to love your neighbor as you're used to loving yourselves. In other words, no one has to teach you to love yourselves. This is what we naturally do. From the time we are born as a little cuddly baby, we love ourselves. We are selfish. We make sure that we get our rights. We make sure we get our privileges. Otherwise, we'll make it known. We give ourselves a first priority. And Jesus saying, loving your neighbor is to be like, like you're loving yourselves first. In other words, instead of loving yourselves first, love your neighbor. But then he escalates it. You want to see that? He escalates it to a different level altogether. John chapter 13. Would you please turn with me to John chapter 13? Verses 34, 35. A new commandment. It's not a new commandment, it's an old commandment, but he says, A new commandment I give to you. Why is it a new commandment? That you love one another. But that's an old commandment. No, it's a new commandment. Why, does it, why is it new? He says, you love one another. Are you listening here, folks? Are you there? Just as I have loved you, you are to love one another. Not just loving yourself, loving a neighbor more than you love yourselves. It is now escalating to a different level. Love one another just as I loved you. And how did Christ love us? He gave his life for us. This is what biblical love is. You give your life for your fellow believer. True biblical love. It's reflected in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. You probably read that a thousand count times. Hallmark cards have made a fortune by putting it on their cards. And it's in the hands of every Christian 
every home. But I don't know if it really makes sense to many people. Turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 7. What does it say? Love is patient and kind. So when your fellow believer is not getting things right the way you get it, what are you supposed to be doing? Be patient with your fellow believer. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not my way or the highway. It doesn't say you accept me or, you know, you go your way. It says it does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable. How many times have we been irritable with fellow believers? It's like, don't you get it? As a biblical counselor, as a pastor, when I counsel people, sometimes I sit in my office and I'm talking to these people and I have to remind myself the patience of God. Don't you get it? Aren't we irritable at times? Wives, are you irritable to your husbands? Husbands, are you irritable with your wives? It says it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, rejoice with the truth, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That's what true biblical love is. Let me tell you something. You find it very easy to love your own blood, right? Your own blood with this kind of love? Your children? But love another believer in the church with this kind of love, that's altogether another thing. Think about this in your own life. Your own child messes up. And what's your response? Oh, my sweetie pie. That's, and you're so gracious, right? And you're so tolerant. But, and even if it's unbiblical, you try to sweep it under the carpet. Don't get me wrong. And some of us do that. We try to sweep even unbiblical things under the carpet. Knowing it's unbiblical. But someone else in the church messes up. And you're quick to bring the wrath of God upon them. I mean, isn't it true? Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive? Jesus said, seven times seven, no, 70 times seven. Peter understood that well. That's why when he wrote his episode, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, he said, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Why? Because love covers what? A multitude of, speak to me, sins. Love covers a multitude of sins. The man who's able to love other Christians indicates that the love of God is in their lives as well. It indicates that this man has a new nature, he's been born again, and when you become a believer, you begin to have a special affection for another believer. Why? Because we are all adopted into his kingdom. We are all sons and daughters of the Most High God. We are all going to one common place, and that is heaven. That's our destination. Folks, do you harbor hurts? Are you unwilling to forgive? For many days, months, and years, do you desire to get vengeance? Making it literally impossible for the other person to gain your forgiveness because you harbor those hurts. I mean, if you do, it speaks volumes about your profession of faith. Have you experienced the amazing grace of God? Because if you have experienced the amazing grace of God, you will be so willing to share that amazing grace with another person. Remember that parable in the Bible where a man was forgiven of 20,000 years worth of wages, but he got his own servant who owed him three months of wages and he was ready to throw him into prison? That's what we do. Remind yourselves of the gospel. Remind yourselves of what Christ forgave you. And so then you'll be able to look at your fellow brother and sister, your believer in, in Christ, and say, I forgive you. 
And when you say forgive, as far as the sins is from the east and the west, so far have I removed your transgressions from you. That means you totally forgive. You put your sins behind your back so you're not able to see it. You don't munch on that all the time. You don't churn it in your mind. You don't play it as a broken tape recorder in your mind. You don't dangle that care in front of them anymore. You say, I choose to forget it. And you forget it. The Ephesians love the saints. I want you to come to verse 16. I want you to see the last half of 16. And that's where we come to the last point. And that is, are you praying for another believer? Are you praying for another believer? Look at Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. I mean, he prays that they would have godly knowledge. That they would be able to grasp the greatness and the hope of the inheritance that is theirs in Christ Jesus. Paul was intentional about his prayers. Are you interceding for other believers? Paul says here, I do not cease. Look at verse 16 with me, please. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 16. He says, I do not cease to give thanks for you. By the way, do not cease applies even to prayers. So you can read it this way. I do not cease to give thanks for you. And I do not cease to remember you in my prayers. That's what Paul is saying. As we read the Gospels, we see a pattern in Jesus' life. Jesus interceded for the disciples and for the believers. We know that in John chapter 17. We know that in Hebrews chapter 7, that Jesus is always interceding for us. Are you given to praying for another believer? I mean, you will find true joy when you pray for another believer. You should be praying for other believers. James chapter 5, verse 17, it says, pray for one another. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 25, and 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1, we read Paul requesting prayers on his behalf. He said, pray for us. Even Jesus requested prayer. From Peter, James, and John, right? When he was on the Mount of Transfiguration. In Matthew chapter 26. And you say, if that's a concept in the New Testament. No, it was a concept in the Old Testament as well. We read that in 1 Samuel chapter 12. Verse 23. The prophet saying, prophet Samuel saying, Far from it, that I should sin against the Lord by not praying for you, by ceasing to pray for you. The prophet Samuel said, it is a sin if I should cease to pray for you. It's not enough to share God's word with God's people. You ought to be praying that the word of God will bear fruit in their lives. This is what the elders did in Acts chapter 6. They were busy serving at the table and they realized that they had more important things to do and that was the word and praying. They devoted themselves to prayer. Now, you cannot possibly pray for every Christian in this town or every Christian in this state or every Christian in this nation or every Christian in this world like, Lord, bless all the Christians. What does that mean? Are you praying for believers in this church? How can the Lord give us more believers if you find a hard time praying for the believers you have right now? You may ask, how can I pray for those believers? How can I pray for the fellow believers? Let me tell you. You can pray for them using your church directory. Keep your church directory in front of you. And just pray for one person every day. Try to recollect their face. Pray for one person. Pray that they would be a good husband or a good wife. Pray that they would be a good child, I mean, good parent, good worker, that they would be obeying God, that they would read God's word, that they would spend time in prayer. Pray that they would grow spiritually. Things that you can pray for. Pray for one person every day. At the end of seven days, you have prayed for how many people? Seven people. You come to church, identify those seven people. And then... Go back 
and take another seven people for the next week. One person a day and look at what you've done. You would have probably prayed for the entire congregation in about three or four weeks. And you can keep repeating that. Keep repeating that. You know the joy? I tell some of my elders because I pray in my office. I pray for you by name. And I, I see some of you in church and I say, Amen. I prayed for him. The Lord brought him to church. Isn't it a joy to do that? And when you do that, week after week, month after month, you know God will work wonders in this church. God will work wonders in this church. You want the church to grow? You want to fill up these empty pews? Yes, absolutely. Go evangelize, but pray for one another. In closing, I want you to turn to one passage. Would you please turn to Acts chapter 2? Verses 42 to 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And what did the Lord do? The Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved they were meeting regularly they were they were listening to the apostles teaching and look at verse 42 they were breaking bread and they were there was prayers they prayed for one another there was corporate prayer there was intercessional inter, they were interceding for one another they loved one another you see that they shared with one another they shared their possessions with one another. And they were worshiping together, praising God. And the result was God added to their number. It is said that Charles Spurgeon, in his Monday, morning, uh, Monday evening tabernacle meetings, 3,000 people came together just to pray. Just to pray. Church growth was a result of people meeting together to study God's word, loving one another, caring for one another, praying for one another. Are you encouraging another believer? Are you praying for another believer? May the Lord give us the grace to do that. Keep in mind, none of these things dictate or demonstrate your position before Christ. In Christ you are holy. In Christ you are righteous because of his righteousness. And when you do these things, you do it because Christ has saved you. And in demonstration and reflection of that, may we continue to live a life that will bring glory and honor to his name. I pray, Father, that you would be with these precious saints. Lord, these saints that love you, they, they want to obey you. They want to honor you that you would help them, Lord, in everything that they say and do, that you will strengthen them in their spiritual life, and that you will help them encourage another believer and pray for another believer. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.